you're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Zach Bechtold and Matt Franks. If you'd like to learn more about the Bearded Theologians, you can go online at beardedtheologians.com, where we have past podcasts, blogs, and a couple items for sale. So check us out, beardedtheologians.com. Thank you for listening, and enjoy this week's show. So you got another project um, that you wanted to talk to us about. And so, yeah, f- uh, feel free to share with us about this other project that you've got going on as well. So as I said earlier, one of my, um, one of my goals in, in my shift in life has been that I wanted to work on things that I'm passionate about. And because I'm passionate about ministry with, with youth, especially, um, I'm also passionate about the fact that we as the church need to provide um, safe places for our youth to experience God. Um, places with adults who are trustworthy and um, places that that parents know that um, if my youth are in this place the church has done everything they can do to assure that um, that harm isn't going to come to my youth and you know obviously we can't possibly protect anybody from everything Um, it's it's just an impossible task and and living is a risk. I I was having a conversation with my nine-year-old grandson over the weekend and we were talking about uh, he's he's got a lot of adventuresome ideas and so so we were talking about some of those and um, and someone else uh, voiced concern about how safe some of those things might be and we talked about the fact that you know you're not necessarily safe in your own house. And, mm-hmm. um, and so there are no guarantees in life, but, um, but there are certainly things that we can do to, um, to make ministry settings safer. And, um, and that's the whole purpose of safe sanctuaries in the United Methodist Church, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's why it came into being. And um, so for all of my years with discipleship ministries, before that in the local church, um, I, I've been concerned about that and, and wanted to um, be as responsible in connection with that as possible. And, and for the last year and a half that I was at discipleship ministries, I, I was responsible for safe sanctuaries for the whole church. And, um, and so after I left discipleship ministries, one of the, well, one of the things that I recognized while I was here is that um, we are great in the United Methodist Church in terms of requiring policies about safe sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the challenge with that is that we have lots of churches who have policies and, um, and those policies may or may not have been fully Put into place in terms of practice mm-hmm. and the practice is really where kind of the rubber hits the road you know if if we're not taking what we know is important in terms of policies and implementing those in our practices then um, then we may be creating some gaps and and uh, creating those safe ministry spaces and so mm-hmm. um, and so after I left um, discipleship, um, one of the things that, that I have been doing is working with a company called Safe Gatherings that provides, um, that provides an online platform for training for um, safe sanctuaries, kinds of, you know, they're branded as Safe Gatherings. Um, their training covers um, what needs to be covered for a volunteer or they actually also work with some annual conferences in terms of their clergy. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in addition to the, the training, by the way, I took the training just to be sure I knew what was in it Mm -hmm. and I made a hundred. I, I just want you guys to know that (laughs) I, I actually was able to pass it. Perfect. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, so in addition to that, they they handle the uh, the background checks and they also handle the reference checks. Um, you know, a lot of churches say, "Well, we just don't have anybody to take care of that for 
us or we don't really have the security in terms of a place to keep the records for, for the background checks and, um, and all of those kinds of things. And, and Safe Gatherings came out of the Church of the Resurrection. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually owned by a family that goes to the Church of the Resurrection. They were already doing online training for other things. And, um, and so the person in charge of Safe Sanctuaries came to them and said, um, you know, is there a way that um, that you could do online training for for safe sanctuaries and um, and so safe gatherings was born and mm -hmm. and um, I've had the the chance to get to know the the family there and um, and know their care and um, have had an opportunity to talk with some of the folks in the annual conferences that are using them um, and and that has been really helpful um, for a lot of annual conferences because they had all the resources in one place. I know even um, in my last local church situation, we would have somebody who volunteered in the middle of the year and we didn't have a training coming up for safe sanctuaries. And so either that person had to wait or we had to do kind of a one-off training Mm -hmm. And which was time consuming. Um, it was important to do, but it was still time consuming. And, um, and with the platform that Safe Gatherings offers, there's, you know, you just have the person go on the website and, and they're able to go through the process and you get a notification when they've um, completed that process. I know um, I, I did that whole process and, and had my pastor um, be one of my references. I, you know, I needed a clergy reference and I, there are a lot of them. I guess I could have asked you guys to be my references <laughs> yeah. too. <huh? laughs> but um, but I, I sent a text to my pastor and said, uh, Jacob, can you, be my, can you be my reference? And he said, sure. And about an hour later, I got a text back from him saying, it's taken care of, so they had obviously already communicated from the time that I, I submitted it. It was done pretty quickly, mm -hmm. um, and and so I was I was fairly impressed with that. And there are, um, you know, there are different background checks. I mean, you can do. I think there are even free ones online, mm -hmm. and you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've learned, I've learned a lot. One of the things that I've learned is. I always thought a state level or a national background check would be better than a county level background check. Mm. But, but I now know that all counties don't uh, report their findings to, uh, to states or maybe they only report convictions and, and um, not accusations and that kind of thing. And so, um, so I've learned that there are different levels of background checks that are really important to do. And, um, and because Safe Gatherings has done that work and figured that out, I've, I've really appreciated the opportunity um, to work with them. And the, the other thing I've learned, and um, learned this fairly recently, is those of us who are clergy, um, you know, we have to go through that process um, mm -hmm. before we're ordained. And, um, but different annual conferences have different requirements after that. And so you might be working in a church who has a requirement that every two or three years you update your background check, but your annual conference may not have that kind of requirement. Um, and, and they may have a, fi a five or a seven year requirement. Well, you know, a lot can change in that length mm -hmm. of time. And mm -hmm. we'd like to think the clergy, that's not really an issue. You know, they are the pastor of the church. And so right. we should be able to, to not be concerned about that. But I think we as clergy cert certainly should be the people who are willing to set the, set the standard and, yeah. um, and say, you know, yes, we require this of our volunteers. And so, yes, as a volunteer, I do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's some important things there. And, um, and so I'm excited that I get the chance to talk with people in annual conferences. Next week, I, I get to be in the Florida conference and talk with a group of youth pastors there um, about how they can use this online training, background checks, reference checks 
to be able to um, to know that um, that the folks they're using have, or at least to know they've done the best to their ability mm -hmm. um, to have people who are, um, you know, who who are screened and who are good influences and trustworthy influences for the children and youth that they work with. Um, so it's so it's a fun thing to do, um, and actually a local church. You know, I'm mostly talking with annual conference folks mm -hmm. because there are great things if if an annual conference has what they call an enterprise account, then um, if you're going to go to summer camp for a week to be the clergy, then um, then the person in the annual conference office can pull up your record and, and see when the last time you had a background check was and mm -hmm whether you pass the test. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I know with the, uh, the youth event that, um, that we did while I was at Discipleship Ministries, um, sometimes that's a challenge because people have been through background checks in their annual conference, but, um, but or in their local church, but we don't have a record of that. And so mm -hmm. trying to either get, um, an affidavit sign that says, yes, this person has gone through that process or, um, or having to have that person do a background check process in order to be a part of the event is, can be challenge, challenging when you start looking at hundreds of volunteers. Right. And, so, um, and so there's this dashboard that allows uh, you to be able to know that on the conference level. Um, that dashboard also helps you know if, if you know you're having background checks done every three years and it's six weeks out from that three years you get an email and the person gets an email that says it's time to go online and and um you know kind of re-up that so um so there are some really good things about um about the ability to do that there are other companies that do it and there are, there are conferences that use other companies as well um i just happen to feel really good about safe gatherings and have appreciated yeah. the opportunity to work with them some. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have any comments or questions about that. Well, no, just in the importance of safe sanctuaries. Um, I worked in the church with youth and children um, for seven years in two different churches before I ever did anything safe sanctuaries ever had a background wow. check and it was the third church that I I went to that required it the other two churches had policies never followed up on them yeah. uh, and so it was the third church I was hired in full-time as a youth and children's director that said hey uh, we have to do safe sanctuaries oh yeah sure okay no, 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 we really have to do it. And, and yeah. went through the process of it. And I had a really love-hate relationship with it until, <laughs> I, until I had an issue of, of mm -hmm. taking somebody to camp who acted inappropriately and had to be sent home, uh, an adult. And it completely changed my mindset on the necessity of having to have these, uh, having, to ha having to actually follow through on our process follow through on uh, the policies that we put in place and how important they are because it, it truly at the end of the day is to keep kiddos safe. And that's important. It is. And, and, and one of the things I found funny is that when I was an associate pastor and they were like, no, Matt, you have to go to safe sanctuaries training mm -hmm. and you need to sit through our training. And I said, well, which training do you all use? And they said, well, we use the ones that they can't provide. And I said, look on the back of that. My name's on the back of that. I helped write that. I helped write the, the policy. I, I know it fairly well. Now, I'll, you know, I'll be a good boy and I'll go sit through the training. Um, and that's been one of the things um, in, in my current appointment, we're, we're in the process of rewriting our safe sanctuaries policy to be more modern and updated, um, but to also not be as, I mean, it's very camp centric. Sure. Um, mm. And we have, we have some things that we uh, don't necessarily do that are different than what they do at camp. And so trying to fit that into our policy uh, with our preschool and, um, and having to address, because we do have some vulnerable adults and, and having to really define who those are and how we handle those mm -hmm. and, um, and being able to provide. We, do, we try to do a training two or three times a year um, because we always get new preschool staff. And so like we, that's like top priority for us. And, 
um, you know, uh, I think this would be a really good resource for uh, churches to have that if they don't have that capability mm -hmm. um, to have that available uh, for them. Because I know it was like being in a small church and like walking up to my church leaders and saying, all right, so we're going to do this youth event and you all are going to be there and uh, I need you to do a uh, safe sanctuary training. I need a background check. And everybody's like, nope, I'm out. I'm not doing yeah. this. Or yeah. like, like, I don't, um, and, and, and they just didn't want to take the time, but to have a space mm -hmm. where they could do it online mm -hmm. at the comfort of their own home, you know, that, that I think that can provide some space that um, hasn't ever been there before in a lot of our churches. Um, One of the, the access to it of, cause I've been in conferences that have had both had programs that were online and people could do it wherever they were and then had to sit down and do the three hour training with a bunch of college students or adults mm -hmm. or whomever. Uh, and it's hard. It, you know, uh, just the access to be able to do it where people are on their time, you know, right. and not having to bring an extra person in or not having to set out an afternoon or uh, two or three times a year to get it done. Because uh, like you say, you, you just have people waiting in the wings that want to do ministry. And it's like, well, you got to wait till October. Gotta get this done. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. Um, and, and so it helps our churches be uh, a lot more streamlined and effective and efficient in how we do ministry and um, get people into ministry that uh, are feeling called in those spaces in our local churches and camps and every everything we do with children and youth. Well, so, and that's where it'd be nice to have, I mean, shoot, you would think that in a connectional church that like if I was going to go to Montana, mm -hmm. my, my safe sanctuary practices sure. would transfer over. Right. But in a lot of ways, it doesn't. I know mm -hmm. that's been a conversation we've had in volunteers and mission stuff um, is, is when we provide that, you know, like um, we have a group going to McCurdy and McCurdy like wanted us to send them exactly what we do with our VIM teams. So that way they knew mm -hmm. that what we were providing was going to be up to their standards. Um, and so it'd be nice to have a, like a universal platform um, mm -hmm. in, in a connectional system that we are, at least until, you know, We'll see what happens after May, but, um, <laughs> but still, even then, there could still be possibility of connection, even sure. though we may be disconnected. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I think this is another one of those places that, you know, no matter where we are on theological issues, biblical mm -hmm. issues, sexual issues, right. um, I, I can't believe, just, just from the people I know, I can't believe that there are any of us who would want to create vulnerable kinds of situations. Right. And, and it, it actually, you know, I'm excited to be involved at this point in time because, um, because the reality is it's this kind of time where, um, where those kinds of things can happen more easily. You know, the safe sanctuaries just kind of slips through the cracks because we're busy trying to work on mm -hmm. these big issues and topics, but but then that becomes a big issue and topic because right. of the harm that we do to individuals, because of the harm that does to a church and the church mm -hmm. and, um, and it, you know, the financial kind of hit that the church can take because we didn't do the work we should have done in, in the right. first place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, that's what I tell people now uh, that I have less of a love hate relationship with it. Yeah. Of, it's, it's really about keeping kids safe and how can you argue with that? Exactly. You know, we've got to take the time to do these things to make sure um, the people we're putting our, our children with and sending our children to are going to be safe, are going to know yeah. what to do if there is an issue. Uh, if, you know, gosh, it's so, so, so important. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, thank you, thank you, uh, for, for continuing to lead, uh, and be a part of the work of, of doing safe sanctuaries, of doing safe gathering gatherings and getting the word and research and, and oh gosh, the, the programs, you know, the, the accessibility out there, um, because it is important, you know, even, it really in, is. even in rural Montana, where, you know, it's my, all, my kids are the only ones in church. If somebody's yeah. going to go hang out with them, I want to know who's hanging out sure. with them, right? Uh, and, and, and like you said, for the same, for me as the pastor, as the clergy to, to set that standard of, I want you to know who's in front of you. Exactly. You know, that's so, so important. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. 
So, Mike, we, we thank you for your time. Uh, is there anything else you want to share with us as, uh, before we uh, uh, get ready to go? I mean, I know you, I know you got a lot uh, going on. Um, well, uh, we also I'll give you a rest for now. Uh, <laughs> we'll just, we don't have any, we, we, we have nowhere to go. Now, I mean, <laughs> I, I've got a couple of other projects that are kind of out there in the wings mm -hmm. that, um, that I can't wait to tell you about and, yeah. and uh, see moving forward. But, um, but those things are, are not quite there yet. That's you okay. Know? You know, you always have an open invitation uh, to come. Well, you us. guys are awesome. I oh. appreciate the invitation and, yeah. um, you know, appreciate you guys and what you're doing and, and um, the way that you use your voices and your access to be able to, um, to share a lot of different opportunities, possibilities in ministry. Uh, so thanks. No, thank you. You're uh, truly the one to blame for this. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and actually, maybe, you could, you, maybe it was the weather. Maybe it was the <laughs> maybe weather. It was the, I mean, you could definitely add, you know, co-inspire of uh, bearded theologians to your sure. there you uh, go. long list of there things. You go. And, I'll take uh, it. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I you know, catalyzed that. That's right. You yes. were lead catalyst here yes. as well. That's right. Yeah, I just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> Neither did we, and it's been perfect. Cool. So we thank you for your time, Mike. And so for the Bearded Theologians, I'm Matt Franks. I'm Zach Bechtold. Thanks for checking us out. Thank you for listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share on all social media outlets. You can check out old episodes and more information at beardedtheologians.com. Thanks for checking us out.